Hey guys, it's Metacosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense, continuing our physiology playlist. In previous videos, we talked about gastrointestinal physiology. We talked about the slow waves versus spike potentials. We talked about motility versus secretion, digestion versus absorption. We talked about what happens in your mouth, which is mastication, chewing, and uh, salivation. And then deglutition, which is swallowing. After this, we have gastric motility and secretion, intestinal motility and secretion, and then defecation and the defecation reflex. This was the alimentary canal. We also have accessory organs, which include salivary glands, liver biliary system, and your pancreas. Today, it's a very quick review. If you find that we are going so quickly, please watch the previous videos first. Let's review. The wall of your gut is made of four layers. Mucosa, submucosa, musculosa, serosa. As for the nerve fibers in them, the myenteric plexus is here. The submucosal plexus is here. Why are we doing this? You need to digest, i.e. break down the macromolecules into micromolecules because the micromolecules will be able to be absorbed, which means it's capable of crossing a membrane and ending up in the portal venous system if it's water soluble or the lacteals and lymphatic system if it's lipid soluble. If it's water soluble, it's gonna go to the liver for metabolism and then before you know it, hepatic veins in few vena cava the heart, and then the heart will supply the rest of your body with nutrients. What was not digested and was not absorbed is gonna end up in the stool. Hashtag excretion. If you cannot digest, you will be unable to absorb. Let's digest from head to toe, from cranial to caudal, from oral to anal, from proximal to distal, from gum to to bum. To understand your gut, you need to understand the nervous system surrounding your gut. Back to basics, the nervous system is either somatic or autonomic. Your gut is autonomic, of course, which means involuntary. The autonomic is sympathetic, parasympathetic, and enteric nervous system. My enteric is for motility and submucosa is for secretions. On top of that, we have outsiders trying to influence the enteric nervous system. We have the parasympathetic, which is the friend of the GI tract, and the sympathetic, which is the foe. Parasympathetic uh, vagus and pelvic nerves to boost motility and secretion. That's the friend. As for sympathetic, we're talking about thoracolumbar, greater and lesser splanchnic nerves, prevertebral or collateral or aortic plexus ganglia, sympathetic will inhibit motility and secretions. This is the enemy. Here's the lovely enteric nervous system in the wall of your gut, which means your gut has its own brain, so to speak. On top of that, we have outsiders. The parasympathetic is trying to boost motility and secretions, but the sympathetic is trying to inhibit motility and secretions. In order for you to move, you need contractions. In order for you to secrete, you need to contract the asinus to squeeze it and get the secretions out. In other words, you need contraction. And there is no contraction without nerve stimulation first. That's why we have the slow waves. These are not true action potentials. They are just small waves humming and buzzing in the background. On top of that, there is the foreground spike potentials, true action potentials leading to true contractions. Contract the smooth muscles, hashtag motility, contract the asinus, hashtag secretions. Here are the slow waves and then boom, the actual action potential known as spike potential. Thank you calcium influx for depolarization, which is activation. Thanks to potassium efflux, this is repolarization, which is inactivation. Listen to this, your digestive system is all about digestion and absorption by means of motility and secretions. The motility is either peristalsis or mixing, the secretions are either exocrine or endocrine. That was beautiful. The motility, peristalsis and mixing. Peristalsis to push the food from proximal to distal, from oral to anal. Mixing is the segmental movement, some chop, chop, chop action. This will also help mix the food with the secretions. Where did the mucosa of your gut come from? From the endoderm. How about the smooth muscles of the gut? From the mesoderm. How about the enteric nervous system and the sympathetic and the parasympathetic? from the ectoderm. 
You mean surface ectoderm, right? Shut up. Surface ectoderm is for the epidermis of your skin, hair, nail, etc. We're talking neuroectoderm here. The centers for the reflexes are in the CNS. The nerve fibers, whether they are sympathetic, parasympathetic, or enteric, are part of the peripheral nervous system. Does anyone remember Hirschsprung disease or aganglionic megacolon? Yeah, it was failure of migration of the neural crests to the colon. Thank you. And we talked about Hirschsprung disease in previous videos in this physiology playlist. This video is divided into three parts. Number one, digestion. Number two, absorption. Number three, excretion. Digestion has two types, intracellular and extracellular. Today we're concerned with the extracellular digestion. How about intracellular? This is the textbook of biochemistry, that's another topic. Extracellular is to get the nutrients to the cell. Intracellular is what happens in the cell. You can classify it in another way, mechanical for motility and chemical for secretions. There you go, mechanical motility my enteric in the musculosa, but chemical means secretion by the submucosal plexus which is in the submucosa. From head to toe, let's start in the mouth. The motility in the mouth is the mastication, thank you mandibular nerve. The secretions of the mouth are salivation, thank you salivary glands, the major, and don't forget the minor salivary glands as well. The main enzyme here is the salivary amylase and a tiny amount of lingual lipase. Here are the four muscles of mastication, all of them are supplied by the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. The center of mastication is in the pons, but the center of swallowing is in the medulla. The center of vomiting is in the medulla. How about the center for defecation? It's in the conus medullaris of the spinal cord. Pause and review. We have some glands inside your elementary canal from oral to anal. Other glands are outside the GI tract and these are the accessory glands, salivary glands, pancreas, liver and gallbladder. Remember before that ghrelin is for gluttony. It wants you to eat like mad and to become obese. Glucagon, which is released in the fasting state, also wants you to eat, because if you fast for too long, you will starve. Neuropeptide Y also wants you to eat. However, neurokinin wants you to vomit. That's a big difference. So ghrelin wants me to eat and become obese. On the other hand, leptin, just remember leptin T. Look at that. Look at the thread of the tea bag. Thread, thread. Leptin wants me to be thin, like the leptin tea. Next, let's talk about being thirsty. If you lost pure water, ADH will go up. It will try to reabsorb the water back again in the kidney and it will tell you to drink water. Aldosterone is similar, but aldosterone does not care about water only. It cares about water and sodium. The nerve supply of the tongue was discussed before. Remember that the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands are supplied by cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve. But the parotid gland is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Here is salivation, primary stage versus secondary stage. All of this was discussed before. Just remember, your saliva, relative to your plasma, is richer in potassium and bicarbonate, but poorer in sodium and chloride when compared to your serum. Your saliva is hypotonic, but your plasma is isotonic. After chewing and salivation, it's time for you to swallow. <clears throat> I mean to deglitate. Let's be professional over here. Deglitation or swallowing happens on three phases. You have the buccal phase, voluntary. Pharyngeal and esophageal phases are involuntary. The center for swallowing is in the medulla, because the medulla has four important vital centers, heart and lungs, get it in, get it out. Where was the center for mastication? It was in the pons. How about defecation? It's in the spinal cord. After the esophagus, you go to your stomach. Motility, don't forget the receptive relaxation. Thank you, ATP from the vagus nerve, hashtag pure energic fibers, and secretions, thank you acetylcholine and gastrin releasing peptide, also from the vagus, hashtag cholinergic fibers. Your parietal or eccentric cells will give you the acid, the word oxyntic means acid. The chief or peptic cell will secrete the chief enzyme of your stomach, pepsinogen, 
which will become pepsin thanks to HCL. That's why if I suffer from achlorhydria, absence of HCL in the stomach, my pepsinogen will remain inactive and the pH of the stomach will be higher than it should. That's not good. How the stomach makes the acid hinges upon the activity of the wonderful primary active hydrogen potassium ATPase. Hydrogen is pushed to the cavity of the stomach, potassium is pushed to the bloodstream. The acid is pushed to the lumen of the stomach, the base is pushed to the bloodstream, hashtag the alkaline tide. What are the factors that are pro-acid? Well, do not forget acetylcholine and gastrin. Gastrin is stimulated by GRP. Gastrin is released from the G cells. Both GRP and acetylcholine came from the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10. All of these factors are pro-acid secretion. Moreover, the enterochromaffin-like cells release histamine, which is also pro-acid by a slightly different mechanism. How about the factors that are anti-acid? The prostaglandins are anti-acids. Somatostatin is anti-everything. It hates itself. It's a universal inhibitor, including inhibition of motility and secretion of everything. Before we go to the intestine, let's talk about your GI hormones, collectively known as enterogastrone, because they came from the intestine and the stomach. All of them are peptides or derivatives of peptides or proteins. All of them are secreted from the upper part of your small intestine, except gastrin, which is secreted from the stomach and the upper part of the small intestine. Most of them are anti-stomach. They inhibit gastric motility and secretion, except gastrin, who is pro-stomach boosting stomach motility and secretions. These are all the hormones that you need to master. Do not forget, hormones are endocrine, ductless, and they are not exocrine. Your salivary glands were exocrine, but your GI hormones are endocrine. How about my pancreas? Your pancreas has both exocrine and endocrine functions. Gastrin is the only one that is pro-stomach. It boosts gastric motility and secretions, especially after you eat. And with enough cortical training, hashtag conditioning, gastrin will be released from the stomach just by smelling the food. Or just by hearing Gordon Ramsay on television saying, Oh, F me, it's aromatic. The next GI hormone is secretin, the hero of secretions. Secretions of what? Tons of water and bicarbonate. From the duct cells of the exocrine pancreas and from the biliary ducts as well. Cholecystokinin pancreozymin. Why call it cholecystokinin? Because I contract the cholecyst, the gallbladder, to dish the bile out into the duodenum. Why do you call it pancreozymin? Because it goes to the exocrine pancreas and will tell it to release the enzymes. But it did not go to the duct like secretin. It went to the acinus of the pancreas. Because who makes your enzymes? The acinus. Who makes water and bicarbonate? The duct. Next, VIP, very relaxing hormone. It relaxes the smooth muscles in the blood vessels, causing vasodilation, and the smooth muscles in the wall of your gut, causing relaxation and dilation. Next, we have GIP, released by the K cells. This is why eating sugar will raise insulin in your blood in greater amount than injecting glucose into your veins. And as the rest of them, GIP hates your stomach. The only one that loves your stomach is, frankly, gastrin. I mean, listen to the name, gastrin, gastric. Next, motilin. Oh, it's pro-motility of everything. Even the gastric pump, intestinal pump, interdigestive myoelectric complexes, commonly known as the MMCs. Very strong purging actions. Now you're ready to talk about the small intestine, motility and secretions. Secretions of enzyme to digest proteins, fats, carbohydrates, and of hormones as we've just discussed. Then your intestine will absorb. How about the stomach? Does the stomach uh, absorb anything? Your stomach rarely absorbs anything. The only things absorbed in your stomach are the highly lipid-soluble compounds, such as aspirin and ethanol. When your intestine secretes organic substances, i.e. enzymes, we talk about this. But when your intestine releases water and electrolyte, we talk about this. 
Here is how your intestine makes enzymes. Don't forget that these enzymes are proteins. So we need raw materials from the blood. We need the nucleus in coordination with the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, to secrete doozy vesicle to exocytosis to the outside, to the lumen of your gut. Acetylcholine is pro-digestion and secretion. Acetylcholine and the family will dilate vessels, bringing more raw materials to the secretory cell. However, sympathetic is the foe. It's fight flight. If you're running from a tiger, do you think it's time for you to digest and absorb? Heck no! So the sympathetic nervous system will vasoconstrict your blood vessels, leading to less secretions. The same sympathetic will dilate blood vessels somewhere else, like vital organs, heart, brain, skeletal muscles, because you're running from a tiger. Fight flight versus rest and digest. Thoracolumbar, craniosacral. No motility, no secretions. Secreto motor. Your stomach was acidic, but your intestine is alkaline. Ever wondered why? Thanks to active secretion of chloride, bicarbonate, and water is gonna follow the sodium chloride hashtag osmosis. Aldosterone never changes. Aldosterone on the kidney had four functions. To absorb sodium and water and to secrete potassium and hydrogen. Aldosterone works on your small intestine and even more on your large intestine. These are the enzymes secreted by the small intestine. We can also add some lipase for fat. But the main ones are for carbohydrates, including maltase, alpha-dextrinase, isomaltase, lactase, sucrase. The ones for protein digestion include aminopeptidase, enteropeptidase, also known as enterokinase, as well as the brush border peptidases. This wonderful enteropeptidase not only digests protein, it also activates the pancreatic enzymes. Here are the pancreatic enzymes. Please pause and review. Don't forget they are activated by the enteropeptidase, secreted by your intestine. Here is the exocrine pancreas with all of its enzymes, and here is the endocrine pancreas with its hormones. Next, the liver and the biliary system. Don't forget the ampulla of vata, which is a combination, a union between the common bile duct and the main pancreatic duct. And before you know it, we open into the posteromedial aspect of the second part of the duodenum of your alimentary canal. The lovely pancreas is important for digestion of proteins, carbohydrates, and fat. And I said digestion. I mean chemical digestion, enzymatic digestion. But when it comes to bile acids and bile salts, it's not chemical digestion, it's mechanical digestion by means of emulsification, agitation with water, micelle formation via increasing the surface area available so that the pancreatic enzymes can come and actually digest the core of the fat. This is the story of mycelial formation. We talked about this before. First, we make the mycelial's lovely shapes, the water soluble on the outside, the fat soluble on the inside. That's why we call them amphipathic, because they are like an amphibian. Part watery, part lipidy. Then we'll go inside the brush border of the intestine. These fats will combine again to form chylomicrons, microscopic chemicals in the chyle, which is a special lymph, inside the lacteal, which will take you to lymphatic vessels, which will take you to the thoracic ducts, which will take you to big veins, which will take you to the right atrium of the heart. This is the entire story of the role of the bile acids and bile salts in the emulsification of fat. Please pause and review. Why are we doing this in order to digest the food? and then absorb it, and then send it to the cell. Now we're talking about internal digestion. Thank you, Krebs cycle and electron transport chain for providing me with energy. Now let's talk about digestion of carbohydrates, proteins, and fat. Here's the entire story of carbohydrate digestion. Please pause and review. Here is the entire story of protein digestion. This is what happens in the stomach. This is what happens in the small intestine. Pause and digest. And you know the story of the fat. It's the mycelial formation and then to the brush border and then package me into chylomicron packages. Boom, lacteals, lymph vessels, big veins. In order for you to absorb fat and the fat-soluble vitamins K, E, D, and vitamin A, 
you need three organs to be healthy. Number one, liver and biliary system. Number two, pancreas. Number three, the gut, where the actual absorption takes place. If you are water-soluble, like the carbohydrates and the proteins and the water-soluble vitamins, vitamin B and vitamin C, you will go to blood vessels, not to the lacteals inside, to the blood vessels. But if you are fat-soluble, you're going to the lacteal, which is in the core of the villus. This is the story of carbohydrate digestion. This is the story of protein digestion. And this is the story of fat digestion. If you want to be a good student, bring a piece of paper and draw all of this from memory without looking. Otherwise, there is no hope for you. Oh no, don't worry about me, Medicosis. I will remember all of this on the exam. You will not. Unless you actively use your memory and train your memory to memorize it. So go get your notebook. We are done with digestion, now let's absorb. Absorption in the small intestine is almost identical to reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule of your kidney, with some tiny differences. You see this SGLT2? That was the story in the kidney. In the gut, you can just call it sodium glucose co-transporter. Some authors will say, oh, actually, I'll put uh, SGLT1 in the gut and SGLT2 in the kidney no one cares. Glucose and galactose are absorbed together with sodium via SGLT in the beginning, which means on the brush border or the luminal border. But on the other border, we will go via facilitated diffusion. There is a big difference between active transport versus passive transport. The former needs energy, but the latter does not need energy. However, both of them require a carrier protein. Pause and review. And for the pros, please recall that GLUT2 is present in your two kidneys and in your intestine. However, if you're talking about fructose, well, fructose is weird. Number one, it does not follow glucose. It is not going with the SGLT. It's gonna go to facilitated diffusion on the luminal border rather than secondary active transport, and then it will be converted to glucose by an isomerase, and then you continue as you know. However, there is another difference for fructose. Fructose will not be absorbed with GLUT2. If you absorb fructose, it's gonna happen via GLUT5. Active transport versus passive transport. This is secondary active transport, SGLT, but this is facilitated diffusion. Don't forget that fructose is weird. And uh, all things being equal, if you eat an equal amount of glucose and fructose, your gut will absorb more glucose because fructose is weird. Fructose requires too much. And there is a rule of economics that says, uh, when prices go up, the quantity demanded goes down. When it becomes expensive to absorb fructose, your intestine will absorb less quantities of it. But hey, medicosis, you did not take into account the difference between elastic demand and inelastic demand. Shut up. If you are water soluble, don't forget the vitamin B and vitamin C as well, you're going to the blood. However, if you're fat soluble together with vitamin D, E, K, A, you're going to the last lacteals which are lymph not blood the blood is going to the portal vein to the liver to the ivc however the lacteals are going to the lymph to the thoracic duct to the left subclavian vein to the svc superior vena cava rather than inferior vena cava you can remember it by saying fats are fabulous they go to the superior vena cava Proteins, carbohydrates, vitamin B, vitamin C, I'm going to the blood. However, all the fats and vitamins A, E, D, K are going to the lacteal, which is lymph. But eventually everything will end up in the heart. Water-soluble vitamins will follow the water to the blood. Lipid-soluble vitamins will follow the lipid to the lacteal. But let me be even more specific. Some fatty acids are short or medium chain. They can sneak their way to the blood because they are so small. However, the big ones, the long chain fatty acids, the glycerol, the cholesterol, the vitamins, these are big molecules, relatively speaking, which means they have to go to the lymph. And this is everything you need to know in one slide. Last, it's pooping time. Your large intestine does not just poop. It absorbs tons of stuff back to the blood. Do you want to lose all of that salt? No. Do you want to lose all of that chloride? No. Do you want to lose all of that water? No. We will absorb it back. Let me just help paint a picture for you. In your colon, you had stool mixed with water. 
dirty water. Your body will absorb most of that dirty water back to the blood. Ew, disgusting. Shut up, your body will clean all of this for you. Otherwise, you would spend hours in the bathroom every day and you'll have to drink gallons and gallons and liters and liters of water every day. Half of your life will be wasted drinking and pooping. The anatomy. Pause and review. Don't forget that this belongs to the mid-gut, supplied by the vagus nerve when it comes to the parasympathetic and by the greater splanchnic nerve when it comes to the sympathetic. However, the distal part of the colon belongs to the pelvis, the hind gut, which means it is supplied by the pelvic nerves, parasympathetic, and the lesser splanchnic nerve, sympathetic. Don't forget the symbiosis between you and your colonic bacteria. Don't forget that your intestinal bacteria helped convert bilirubin into bilenogen. They also make vitamin K for you and some vitamin B1 and some vitamin B12 among others. The balance between uh, should I absorb water or not absorb water is why you can get diarrhea or constipation. Sorry, this is a mistake here. When we're talking about the gut, we should say absorption. But when we talk about the kidney, we should say reabsorption. So this should have said just absorb. What the flip is rugag? Rugag is anything that will end up in the toilet from your colon, which includes water, the non-digested, non-absorbed food or particles, dead epithelium, bacteria, etc. And don't forget to listen to your natural urge. Train yourself to poop after your first meal of the day. To take advantage of your gastroileal, gastroenteric, and gastrocolonic reflexes, which boost the motility of your gut. That's why if you're a doofus, if you abuse laxatives for years and years and years, you will lose the natural urge, your colon will be atonic, and you will end up chronically constipated. If you like this video, check out my CNS pharmacology course at metagosisperfectionetics.com. I also have a renal physiology course. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense.